Welcome in, everybody. Hour number two of the Lombardi Line presented by DraftKings. We're back at our sport, Circus Sportsbook studio here in downtown Las Vegas. A lot to talk about this hour. He's Mike Palm. I'm Ben Wilson. We're in for Stormy and Michael today. We'll have Jonathan Von Tobel, our senior NBA analyst, join us to talk some NBA as well as college basketball with the women's title game coming up 3 p.m. Eastern today. Men's title game is set for tomorrow just after 9 Eastern as well. We also bring one of our Friday staples of the show <laughs> to our Sunday show. Mike, would Palm have a qualm? Excited to throw some topics at you in a little bit. Uh, pumped for that. We'll recap our best bets. If you missed anything we talked about in hour number one, we'll talk some college hoops plays as well as uh, some MLB on the card here for today. We start, though, Mike, talking some top headlines and the big headline over the last 48 hours. It's been this developing situation for Kansas City receiver Rashi Rice in a wide receiver core that already was – uh, pretty weak with the exception of Rice and his breakout end of rookie season for the defending champs here. Uh, the, uh, the official word, though, coming out of that uh, crash that happened in Dallas, uh, A, police found 10.8 grams, less than an ounce of marijuana, in the Lamborghini that Rice was driving, according to the police report obtained by WFAA TV there down in Dallas. Uh, an attorney for uh, Rice did admit at a news conference a couple days ago that Rice was driving the Lamborghini in that car. Uh, now you're in a situation here where because of the, uh, the the marijuana that they found, it could be a Class B misdemeanor charge in Texas, which means up to 180 days in jail, fine not to exceed $2,000. That is the legal part of this. Now we wonder what are the ramica- ramifications for Kansas City and what this is going to mean. As much as we focus on the on-field stuff here, Mike, when we talk betting, uh, now it automatically leads us into next year outlook and what the Chiefs do in the draft here coming up end of the month. I think the thought was they were already going to look for a receiver, right? Probably, but yes. Rice had been a terrific story the back half of the year uh, and emerged as his number one wideout target. And I mean, I would think you would have to handicap that, that he probably doesn't see the field this year. Um, with the combination of the drugs, I mean, he may be going to jail, may not be, but in combination with putting those people's lives at risk with this street racing and you know people have it on video on their phones as well i mean guys that were taping it so um i think you have to assume when you're handicapping kansas city that he's not going to be there and they're going to have to plug several holes uh at the wide out position what it's interesting is that a lot of times you see sports books really force you to pay a tax when there becomes a, a national narrative over okay team a has to draft position x we saw it with the Green Bay Packers when they refused to draft an offensive player and refused to draft a wide receiver for Aaron Rodgers, where sportsbooks were making you pay a huge price. Ironically, the Packers still weren't drafting <laughs> wide receivers, so you would have lost even if you paid into that tax and laid like a dollar forty-five or so. With the fact that the Chiefs, you know, they picked toward the end of the first round as a, you know, as a result of being that defending champion here at the end of the first round. So you don't see maybe the same sort of tax, but DraftKings does have that prop up right now for a receiver to be the first drafted player for KC. It's even money. It's plus 100. Offensive lineman plus 145 is the second choice. Do we view this wide receiver class to be deep enough where Kansas City looks to wait a little bit longer and looks to the strategy that other teams have gone with, which is try to find some gems in that second, third, fourth round that have been successful in years past. And, and Michael speaks to this all the time about not drafting wide receivers high, that you can find plenty of value in rounds two, three, and beyond. Um, it's interesting because you're talking about the tax, and it's also going to be interesting, does, does the market continue to move as news develops ahead of the draft on – uh, Rishi's uh, situation here. I think I would wait because I think the market will continue to move. And if you do believe they're going to get a lineman and try to look in the second round for, for a wide receiver, you're going to get an even better price. The issue now, you just look at the depth chart here for KC. We just have no idea what's going to happen uh, with Rashi Rice going forward. I mean, the projected starters here, even if you included... <laughs> Uh, Rashi Rice, you know, it's a situation where you're, you know, you're, you're talking uh, Justin Watson in there and Hollywood Brown, they'll, they'll try to resuscitate his career after, uh, you know, look, it was uh, not a not a total failure in Arizona for him, but Hollywood Brown certainly has not developed into the receiver a lot of people thought when he went to Baltimore as he enters his sixth year in the league. But after that, I mean, you go down, it's like Kadarius Tony, Justin Ross, Sky Moore, a whole lot of names that Chiefs fans, you don't really feel bad for them because they won a title and they've won a title back to back years. But Chiefs fans look at that and they go, really, we're going to have to suffer through this sort of these sort of names again, trying to create separation and catch balls for Patrick Mahomes in 2024. You just can't think that that is by any means a finished product. Oh, not at all. And and it's going to be multiple picks over the course of the round. Sky Moore, I know they had a lot higher hopes for 
uh, coming out of Western Michigan. It hasn't really panned out yet. Um, so, yeah, the depth chart. And, I mean, like Tony, I would draw a line through him. I mean, this this was a, a, a complete failed yeah. project, and I don't I don't know that he sees the field with the Chiefs at all this year. You can't teach someone to be a wide receiver at this point. His, the hands just aren't he, – he doesn't catch the ball properly. I had a lot of opportunities. Or really to understand learn, yes. the line of scrimmage. I, I also wonder the other, other kind of unspoken part. Of, we're talking receiver core. Travis Kelsey is part of that, even though he's a tight end. And we saw him as a you know, 34-year-old last year have stretches to, in the regular season where clearly looked a step slower, was able mm. to find a second wind into the postseason and still be really, really productive. At what point, Mike, do we start to see – I mean, a tight end who's taken so many shots, he's going to be 35 – uh, coming up in October, by week six, you'll be a guy, you know, not many tight ends last in their age 35 season. At what point do we see that fall off happen for a guy who's now older than Rob Gronkowski was when he, uh, when he called it quits and was way, way past his prime with the number of shots he took? Well, look, his brother retired and there was a lot of speculation he might as well, right? And, and so he's going to give it another shot and maybe this is the last go round and how much is left in the tank physically. I mean, he still relies on... Uh, on a tremendous cast, catching ability, but he was a great open open field runner, and you know those skill sets are diminishing as you get past uh, past 35. Uh, as we all know, nobody really beat Father Time except for Tom Brady, and um, so I don't know how much longer he can be your number one, or if he is your number one, it's successful in that yeah. in that effort. What's funny about all this negative, you know, the negative thought here around the the Chiefs side, especially on the offensive side of the ball, and yet. When you talk to national media and you talk about, okay, who's your, who's your early pick to win the Super Bowl next year? Everything you hear is, well, I can't bet against the Chiefs, even though they're plus 550. That's an insane number that's not, not worth betting uh, whatsoever. Yet, if you're forced to make a bet, a lot of people would tell you, well, you know what? They'll probably find a way. Is that good enough, really? I mean, is it good enough to just say, well, they've been there. They have the infrastructure. They'll figure it out. Well, what is it? Seven straight AFC title games? Is that what? I mean, it's, it's ludicrous. Uh, this run, when you come to think about it, how they've been there every year of, of, of Mahomes' tenure. So, I mean, if you could pencil it, if, if, if I said pick the board and I can guarantee you one of these teams is going to be in the Final Four, um, you start out in a pretty good position if you can do that. I, I don't tend to ever bet teams. I think 7-8 to 1 is even too short on a team that should be the favorite to win the Super Bowl because it's it's just that difficult. And we've seen the NFL do a tremendous job with parity because every year you have these worst to firsts. And first to worst in these divisions. So it's just too short of a price. And also, I know we like to talk about futures and it's great content, but you're also, you know, you're locking your money up here for you know, nine months. You are. <laughs> yes. What uh, is there really a good point of, uh, of doing that number when it's that low anyway? Yeah. Until December, that number is not really going to shorten much. Mm-hmm. Uh, if anything, it might even lengthen if there's a slow start for Kansas City, kind of like they had uh, a season ago. One very popular team who's getting the respect in the betting market and We've seen some shifts here over the last few days because of the big, the latest big offseason signing. It's the Houston Texans who acquire Stephon Diggs from the Buffalo Bills, and that that really seems to be your leader in the clubhouse, Mike, for the hot team heading into 2024 with the way they went from worst to first a season ago and how good C.J. Stroud proved to be as a rookie. The question is how, how quickly can those two get on the same page and integrate a guy like Steph Diggs into the offensive system, and uh, how fair now are the prices going to be on Houston now that they are getting so much of this love in the market? Yeah, they've come down a bit. Not from I guess it went from eight, it was eighteen to one, and then seventeen to one, and now sixteen to one. Down from twenty or twenty-one to one prior to the trade. I think in the short term it's good, and it might be okay in the long term. I know there's no guarantee beyond this year, but he's playing to drive the next contract as well. Um, I think moving gives somebody a chance to get a new lease on life, to say, to get a fresh outlook with no preconceived notions. When he goes into a new locker room, maybe it'll be great for Jerry Judy going to Cleveland from Denver when things things don't go well. Obviously, Buffalo wanted him out. This is the addition by subtraction, um, and it leaves some stress maybe from the quarterback and the head coach. But I think it improves the Texans team. Now, they are loaded at the wide receiver position, and can they get Diggs enough touches to satisfy him, or can he change his frame framework that he looks at things from? Look, the the thing that stood out to me was all those quotes coming out of Buffalo after, you know, after Diggs leaves, and people asking about Joe Brady and what you know as an offensive coordinator. Okay, was this was this a Diggs thing or was this a scheme thing? And when you look at it, you know, midseason ad there, Joe Brady, and a lot of quotes saying, "Well, he's not really respected in NFL circles because he doesn't really know the scheme very well." 
and the you know the, the separation stats from a lot of these guys and just the the general spacing that the Buffalo Bills had on the field was just non-existent. I mean, it was well below league average. And so there's part of me that looks at that and goes, you know what, new lease on life to begin with. And also the scheme probably was not very optimal to maximize Stephon Diggs' potential there in his final few games as a Buffalo Bill. That should correlate to a lot of success. DraftKings has set his total 949 and a half. So DraftKings certainly expects a boost there for uh, Diggs going to Houston. Probably not something worth betting, Mike, because of how inflated that That's number is. It's too high, um, unless you want to try to fade it. Um... Because the ball's going to get spread around there. They got some really good uh, young talent. Um, and I loved Hank Dell coming back off the injury. It's interesting that you say that about separation because so many of those routes they run are these comebacks and hooks and that. And, you know, mm-hmm. he'll make a catch and then the next ball is, you know, somebody's right on him and he drops it. And, and there's you can't really get a rhythm going there because of that short game that they try to run. So that's that's an interesting point about scheme kind of a thing that matters as much as we talk individuals mm-hmm. you gotta be able to set up your guys to, to find uh, to find room in open space 949 and a half again people are gonna look at that yeah. and go well Stefan Diggs yeah, well, 1183 yeah. yards last year and it was by all accounts a bad season but look the context matters here you now have a lot more uh, hands in the jar to be to be spread. and a team that will also run the ball better right Buffalo with the running game is only the quarterback yeah and uh, Bobby Sloak was uh, he ran the ball quite a bit uh, at, at, in stretches as a yep. first year OC for Houston. When we come back, we'll talk would Palm have a qualm? I'm excited to throw some of these topics at our guy Mike Palm when we come back. This is the Lombardi Line with former NFL executive Michael Lombardi. Now here is your host, Stormy Bonatoni on v the sports betting network. If you haven't already, check out the new look VEASAN.com with our best bets, betting splits, exclusive articles, odds by state, betting tools, and betting guides. Right now, we have multiple articles already up, giving you a deep dive breakdown of the national title game for tomorrow night. Purdue and UConn breakdowns from Tyler Shoemaker and Zach Cohen on VEASAN.com. And we'll talk a little bit of Purdue-UConn up next, as well as the NBA card in about 15 minutes. Our senior NBA analyst, Jonathan Von Tobel, is set to join the show. I am told he's got eight. A number of plays, Mike Paul. So excited for that. Three that I see. Three. Mm-hmm. You do, no, that is a number. He's got three. <laughs> also, zero is a number. Zero is also oh, okay. a number. There, there he, does have, he does have plays, <laughs> including the national title game. We'll have that in a little bit. Uh, excited for this segment. If you watch on Fridays, which you should, uh, here to Lombardi Line, whenever Mike Palm is on, we do Would Palm Have a Qualm? Basically, the idea is I'm going to throw out some bets to you, Mike. Are you okay playing these be- placing these bets or... You have a qualm, something you want to push back on. Uh, and a couple will go quick because we've, we've talked briefly about them, but we'll just rehash it again here. Talking NFL draft that's coming up at the end of the month. Drake May to be the third overall pick. It's one, uh, minus 130-ish right now. Jane Daniels has moved ahead of him to be the second uh, overall pick. His favorite at minus 160. Are you find placing that bet now at minus 130, or do you have a qualm with May to be third overall? No, I don't have a qualm because I do believe Daniels is going second uh, to the commanders. So I have no problem with the, the, the May pick at minus 130. Um, obviously, there's some <clears throat> bit of uncertainty, even if Daniels goes second, that May goes third. It's not, I mean, not a given, but you're paying the price of 160, you said, now in the market, just to go ahead and select Daniels to go second. Um, it's a pretty significant difference when you're talking around, around even money, 30 to 60. Um, but I don't have a qualm with it because I do believe that's what's going to happen. The oh, yeah, the other option right now, the thought is that there's been so much buzz on JJ McCarthy. I One mean, through four. If his so five and a half is a draft position. That's now under juiced minus two seventy. Two seventy to be a top five pick. It's like it's a, assumed a done deal. He was plus three thirty to go three uh, third overall. So there is a a school of thought here, and I don't buy into it at all. It, it seems like this is like this this year's quarterback version of all the smoke trying to. Uh, infiltrate and influence the way we bet the top of the draft. But it, the fact that McCarthy now in some circles is viewed as, oh, yeah, he could potentially go uh, over May if it's May versus McCarthy at uh, three. That seems a little bit far-fetched to me. Well, I do think it's far-fetched. I mean, they're, I can't see New England drafting him at three. I think the Cardinals are going to take a wide receiver. Harbaugh may trade out of that spot because he wants an offensive lineman. But somebody going to trade up for him, even to five? I boy, that seems. I'd 
I'd take a shot at the. There's is there a, is that a two way market? Can you take the plus price at the five and a half over? Uh, you can. Let me. What let is me, that price? Let me pull yeah, up plus. what uh, what that is. It is. I want to say it was like plus two twenty five or something. I mean, it's it's a good. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's a good price. The position right now, updating this McCarthy. Sorry, plus two fifteen on McCarthy over Still. five and a half at DraftKings. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. Now we have to I find somewhere else where to, we can bet it. But. That either. Uh, rest of the couple other uh, draft topics to throw oh, okay. your way. The first round quarterbacks over four and a half. It's yes. minus two fifty. You yeah. good with that? Yeah, I'm good with it. Marvin Harrison Jr. First non quarterback drafted. You willing to lay a five dollar price? Are you that you no. have that much conviction? No, not at all. You have a qualm. I have a big qualm. Big with qualm it. with Marvin Harrison because I Jr. think it's more of a pick 'em. Um, with neighbors than this, this is this is too high of a price. I think it's way too high of a price to like. I have that that of this list, this is probably my biggest qualm, because I think this is actually up in the air. I think wide receivers are kind of like flavor of ice cream, just because one is generally considered. You you pick the guy that you think fits your needs, and I know Harrison is the name, and I know he's the best overall player, uh, you know, best overall player for his position on se- several people's draft boards. But I don't think this is. This is a given. And he's he's right now minus 175 Harrison to go fourth overall. And but there's also some thought of you know, what's funny is like neighbors is favored to go fifth at plus two twenty five over Harrison with the thought that it, it could go receiver receiver there four or five in the draft. But we also don't know. I mean, Arizona's in that in that four spot with so much draft capital. Do they do, does somebody move up to take a quarterback four? Did they move down a spot? And who do they prefer? Is it a situation where they'd rather have the neighbors? And it's you know three to one right now, com- compared to the minus five hundred on the Harrison Jr. Front. It's interesting what Harbaugh will do at five because he can take Alt at five. But if he can move back and get more capital and yeah. still take Alt, will he do that? And does somebody want to give up something to go up to five? And if to go up to five, then I'm assuming you're taking one of those wide receivers that wasn't taken four. Whether Harrison was taken and you want neighbors or Adunze, or or. Sure. You know, or neighbors is taken and you want Harrison, maybe that's a more likely move. Still so many moving parts as we have several weeks uh, until the draft. You, in, This has become a thing now, especially in, in the Nevada jurisdiction in Las Vegas. You guys aren't even really booking draft stuff, right? I mean, it's just... No. Well, I know we ta- We had a meeting um, or at least a text conversation during the week about what we were going to do with the draft. And I know Chris Bennett said he'd like to actually offer several dozen props now they're up for a short time right i mean it's a a very short window right before the draft that they go up and the limits are small usually they're a thousand dollars on most of them that we take but he'd like to have a little deeper menu this year last year first year that the public did not overwhelmingly win the draft maybe you know with all the information sometimes too much information can be a bad thing there Uh, for the betters we're talking would palm have a qualm throwing out different topics to mike palm see if he'd be okay (laughs) making these bets or if he's got an issue with them let's transition to major league baseball which you're a daily uh, baseball better tough start for the houston astros man do they look bad two and seven get swept uh to to begin the season by the yankees they are plus 180 to miss the playoffs are you concerned that much about houston where you'd be fine taking a plus 180 shot and i'm not making the postseason i think it's too short um I'd rather get. I think I probably need to get north at 250 to make this bet. So I have a small qualm with it. I like the idea. They've looked bad. I still think they're good at the top of the rotation. Hader, a big problem. I mean, he, he, this was addition by subtraction for the Padres, I believe, and a very key move once they figured out what they got. I don't think he's a very good clubhouse guy as well, and they had a lot of issues in their clubhouse. So I don't mind this bet. But I think that you've got to get a little better price. It's so early. I mean, you know, we've played nine games out of 162, so I'm not ready to throw in the towel, especially when you can go Framber and Christian Javier at the top of the rotation. Uh, this is a like a, a sub uh, sub bullet point of would Palm have a qualm? Do you have a qualm with the head of the MLB P- MLBPA saying that the reason that Spencer Strider and Shane Bieber are having elbow and shoulder issues is because of the shorter pitch clock? <laughs> Seems like a pretty big. That's it's two seconds shorter. I mean, yeah. I mean, come on. I think that's ludicrous. I, I mean, would love to ask Nolan Ryan his thoughts. His thoughts. Clement, I asked Clemens when Clemens was at was was for the Maddox tournament, which we have again coming up in a couple of weeks, last year about it. He says, you adjust everything. They change rules every couple of years, and you just adjust to it. And the better pitchers were quick anyhow. Your defense plays on their toes, and it's, it's overblown. And now yeah, What would it, Mark Burley say to that? Oh, God, he was the best. Uh, Tony Clark, head of the MLBPA. I mean, come on. That's such a ridiculous statement. I'm sorry. We, uh, I'm, I just, uh, you know, I 
you're the type of person I like, like to bring <laughs> stuff like uh, like that up with. I can Other put that on no hyperbole. That's a no hyperbole that candidate. That is a great no hyperbole candidate. Though. Make sure to be on the lookout for that this week. I'm glad I flagged it. Thank just, you. Just for you. One more baseball one for you, Mike. Tariq Skubal, off to a good start for the Detroit Tigers, who lead the uh, the AL Central out of the early, uh, actually a half game behind the Guardians here in the early going. Skubal to win the AL Cy Young, down to plus 650. Where do you stand there? I love Skubal. I think like every third start, he has no hit stuff. 650 is too short on anybody at this time of year to, for to bet the Cy Young, so I do have a qualm. It's just too short. I'm looking for guys in the 15 to 20 to 1 range or higher at this early in the year. You're ta- In June, it's a different story where I'll bet somebody that's 4 to 1 or 6 to 1, but this is too too early. Second only Corbin Burns now of Baltimore after that trade from <laughs> Milwaukee, and it's like we talked about with Scooble, with the Astros, so much of this with baseball, it's timing in your betting. In timing the market, it's probably not a good idea to bet, say, a negative thing on the Astros when they lose 7-9 and nine, and they're viewed as a World Series contender. Same deal with Scooble. Right after he comes off an amazing start, you probably don't want to put in a ticket for uh, Sion. Wait till he has a bad outing and that number uh, drifts a little bit. One more here. Bronny James oh. draft position. 38 and a half. Uh, under is plus 150. Over is minus 200. I'm stunned that, I mean, again, only because it's the last name here, but I'm stunned that with everything that has happened, uh, he is even he's even on the board here to be drafted. But he's a big name, and that's why he is. Lakers are the favorite to draft Bronny at plus 450. Uh, are you, what, do you, what, what do you have a qualm with here? Because it's got to be most of I, these. I, I have think. a qualm with the topic, but more than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It, if if you if you said what bet don't I have a call with I think 76ers and Knicks at nine to one are are probably the most bettable of of this whole market that we're putting out here. I think that that they're, they're interesting fits that he might be and they're yeah and I and and I would think it's over thirty eight and a half but I'm not laying two dollars on on this prop. In both the transfer portal and potentially <laughs> in the draft, the combines <laughs> next month. <laughs> I don't. I don't think he's getting drafted. I mean, that's that's the thing. Now, there's no option for no for uh, for no team. So again, you've got to check the language on this stuff. Oh, it'd be a refund if he doesn't get drafted. I, yes. I yeah. So. Okay. But I average what five points a game off the bench for a bad team. <laughs> Might be one of the great father son combos of all time. I mean, I get it. This is as weak of a draft class as ever. I, you know, cover the the G League, but um, <laughs> guy could use a little more seasoning. That's all I'm saying uh, for for Bronny James. Anyway. Would Palm have a qualm? It's always fun when we bring up random topics for Mike Palm. When we come back, Jonathan Von Tobel, he'll join us to talk some college basketball and NBA when we return to the Lombardi line. This is the Lombardi line with former NFL executive Michael Lombardi. Now here is your host, Stormy Bonatoni on VSEN, the sports betting network. For a limited time, we're offering two weeks of our exclusive betting splits for free. Just sign up at vcin.com slash splits. The vcin betting splits page is updated with DraftKings odds every five minutes. So you can see changes in all the action. Find out where the public is betting based on the number of tickets and where the money doesn't match the public opinion. You can check out not only today's action, but future events as well. Take advantage of this limited time offer. Visit vcin.com slash splits now to claim your free two-week access to vcin's betting splits. Don't strike out on potential winnings. Visit vcin.com slash splits and start making smarter bets today. Still to come on the show, we'll have our best bets. I understand we have some hockey, Mike. A couple right hockey games. All right, let's go. A little Sunday hockey card. I've got some, uh, some MLB, women's college hoops for today. We'll uh, recap here in our next segment. But right <laughs> now, we go out to the progressive guest line. Welcome in our VEASAN senior NBA analyst in Jonathan Von Tobel to talk both NBA as well as a little college hoops as well jvt been a fun uh, weekend here watching the college hoops thanks for joining us today and you have some action on the men's game tomorrow how are you breaking down this line here at six and a half between uconn and purdue to start things off yeah I, so i've kind of fallen in love a little bit with uh, purdue over the last few rounds guys this is going to be the fourth straight round that, that have been on the boilermakers and i'm going to be in again um, catching six, six and a half. Now, uh, full disclosure, I haven't bet it yet. I want to see what the market does, but I think I'll be able to get six and a half when I want to because UConn's going to be the side. But I, I just like the way Purdue's playing at this point. Zach Eady looks comfortable. The way he's moving the ball around, if he gets double teamed, the way he can work against almost any single big that they put against him defensively. You know, these guards, which were a point of contention the way that they played last season, look so much more comfortable this time around. And, and I think, you know, we, we've talked about this ad nauseum at the network all week long leading into the game over the weekend. And while UConn ended up covering, I don't think there's any question they're at the peak of the market right now when it comes to the price 
for UConn. So I think that a Purdue team that they themselves have covered every single game going through here, the NCAA tournament, it's a little undervalued. So I'll go ahead and I will, for the first time, right, Every I, I, I didn't blame anybody else who wanted to get in front of the train uh, in the last two rounds against UConn, but I'm going to finally do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall onto the tracks and I'm going to say, no, 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 this train stops here. So let's see if I end up being a fool like uh, everybody else who tried it previously. But I, I like Purdue in this matchup. All right, Jonathan, let's get to the NBA and the real serious basketball that's taking place this weekend. The Cavs were at Staples yesterday taking on the Lakers. Rallied. They were down 18. They took the lead, and then the Lakers pulled away. They stay in town today to take on the Clippers. Clippers lane three. Yeah, and I think, too, one of the things we have to look out for, and I haven't seen the official injury report yet to list him, Donovan Mitchell is going to be a true questionable here, I think, Mike, because um, remember, he's coming back from that injections that he had in his knee. He also had a broken nose, played 38 minutes yesterday, the second leg of a back-to-back, so you probably want to consider the fact that maybe he's not going to play here today. But very quietly, as I pointed out in the write-up, which I just put up on the website of Easton.com, guys, um, you know, the Clippers are kind of putting their ish together a little bit over a short sample size. They've won seven out of the last 10 games. They've won five out of the last six. They've got a very big win over the Denver Nuggets. And I think the more positive sign from that is not only beating the Nuggets guys, but following that up on the second leg of a back-to-back and winning wire to wire against a really bad jazz team. You know, the, the Clippers team that struggled in the month of February probably falls asleep in that matchup. and doesn't perform particularly well. They dropped 41 in the first quarter and sailed on to a victory there. So I think this team's finally starting to get some stuff together, even without Kawhi Leonard on the floor. So so the fact that I don't think we're going to see Donovan Mitchell, and by the way, even if he does play, since he's come back from these knee and nose injuries, guys, he's shooting 35% from the floor, not even from beyond the arc. So he's clearly not comfortable. His Cavs team is 2-8 and eight, to trade up and against the spread in their last 10 games. Feel comfortable here with the rest advantage for L.A. to come in and back a Mike. And I, I think this is kind of the start of a little bit of a turnaround here for the L.A. Clippers. We're seeing it on a smaller sample size. So as somebody who has backed them to win the whole thing, hopefully that continues to grow and Kawhi Leonard comes back healthy. And JVT length three there with the Clippers. You can still find three and a half there throughout the market. That's so much what I'm looking at right now, JVT. You know, final home stretch for these teams. It's like, okay, what's really the identity how good or bad do I feel about backing them into the postseason and I mean Cleveland feels like one of the big question marks right in the in the east where they're they could fall out of the three seed I mean Magic Knicks right now both on their horse about a half game back it feels like a team that unless they find some sort of change quick here in the last uh, week or two you don't feel very confident here going into the postseason well, and the thing that sucks, Ben, is, you know, as we mentioned, like it was injuries, right? Donovan Mitchell was playing very well. Then he suffers this knee issue, has to get the uh, injections in his knee, hasn't really been fully healthy. We saw Max Struess miss about a month with a calf injury. Dean Wade missed time. Uh, you know, Evan Mobley missed about four or five games. Like this team has been the walking wounded since the all-star break. And that lack of continuity has led to disastrous results. It's, it's actually somewhat similar, guys, to what the Clippers went through. You know, a lot of people were celebrating the fact that the Clippers were sliding off after, I think it was like a 26 and five stretch over 30 one games but Kawhi Leonard had missed time Paul George had missed time you know Terrence Mann had missed time James Le- uh, James Harden so when it's it's not a singular guy when it's multiple different guys in and out of the lineup Ben just like we're seeing with Cleveland that really kills your continuity so it sucks because it looked like a team that at one point this season maybe could push a couple of these teams in front of them but now they're just looking to get their legs underneath them and like you said could fall to the four seed or maybe even lower they're only a half game ahead of the New York Knicks and could you imagine pushing for a two seed at one point they were actually by some projections guys holding about a 65% chance to get the two seed in the East. And now all of a sudden could finish as low as yeah, six. They were favored in the central for a good amount yep. of time. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that's mm-hmm. not worked out well. Speaking of the Knicks and teams uh, that are alternatives to the Celtics in the East, the Bucks are hosting the Knicks this afternoon. Jonathan Bucks lane three and a half. Yeah, this is a little bit of a risk, Mike, because uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo is officially questionable. Now, I expect reading the tea leaves that he's going to be able to play here today, uh, but I've read tea leaves and, of course, have been completely burned. I've been told by Doc Rivers that Giannis was going to play and then he didn't end up playing. So it's a risk, but I, I think that he's going to be here out here tonight. And if he is, you're going to get Damian Lillard. He's not listed. You're going to get Giannis, both of them on together on the floor together for the first time in a while. And obviously we know the situation for Milwaukee, right? They have lost three straight, all of them as 12-point favorites or more against some very crappy teams, Washington, Memphis, and Toronto. Uh, But the fact that you're going to get your full complement of players back here, and you're going to have a matchup advantage. Yes, OG Ananobi's back, guys, but the Knicks are playing three guards regularly. Deuce McBride's playing 40 minutes a game. This team really hurts for shot creation outside of Jalen Brunson. This is a matchup that Milwaukee 
if at full strength today, should be able to bounce back. We've kind of seen this. They've slept walked against some of these teams in the bottom 10 net rating, but have gotten up for these really big games. I mean, guys, the last time we saw Milwaukee play particularly well with everybody, they absolutely dismantled the Oklahoma City Thunder. So, like, yeah. and this is a team that I think can play at a really high level, just slept walked through some bad competition. And by the way, situationally, very good for them. Third game of, I believe it's a six game homestand. They've been at home, they've had their continuity. Now I think they're going to bounce back here against the Knicks. So, uh, yeah, I laid it here, Mike, with uh, the book Milwaukee. A little bit of a risk. I, I'd recommend, um, you know, wait until you get confirmation that Giannis is going to be out there. That half point that you'll miss out on is worth the confirmation of actually having him on the floor. But I took the risk and laid it early. And this has gone up to four in a lot of spots. Seems like most people think in the same way you are at JVT. I will say as a Buck fan, I've not heard booze that loud at Pfizer Forum uh, since back when it was the Bradley Center and Jason yeah. Kidd was about to be fired. I mean, <laughs> Not great. Uh, last, yeah. last few games, too, uh, to say the least. Um, what's going on there? Uh, again, Jonathan Bontel will join us right now on our progressive guest line. You see him on VEASAN primetime. We had his co-host on Tim Murray uh, mm. earlier on in the show. You see him Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern time uh, as well. And as Does long Notre as Dame play uh, today? Uh, we were talking uh, about the nose ring incident with yeah, Hidalgo and how that changed the whole tournament. <laughs> They'd probably be playing Iowa today. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Thanks. Unfortunately, thanks, Tim. Uh, let's talk one other team here in the, in the East. So we just did. Would Palm have a qualm here, JVT? Speaking of other great uh, yep. segments, uh, you you have a qualm with something going on uh, with the Boston Celtics here, especially for oh. our Nesson crowd. Want to talk about what happened? Some of the shenanigans on Friday here. What's your take? So I don't know if you guys saw exactly what uh, Joe Mazzulla decided to do, but what he did was make the Boston Celtics for the rest of the regular season unbettable. With six and a half minutes left in the fourth quarter, guys, the Celtics are up by 19 points. So Joe Mazzulla says, all right, that's it. We're good. Pulls everybody, everybody, and lets the back end of the bench close the game out over the last six and a half minutes. And when I say lets them, guys, they got run on. Like, that got cut to a, a, to a deficit um, against that bench. And he was just like, nope, figure it out. He even said it after the game that he thought it was good for the team to kind of work through these things. So he essentially let the team blow a massive lead so he could get some of these guys some run. For me, it's not like anything nefarious, like how dare you? This is just an example of end of the season for teams like Boston. You just got to be careful. I'd laid nine with the Celtics, was up by 19 with six and a half minutes left to go, and they needed a buzzer beater or essentially a buzzer beater to end up winning that game. It's just something to keep an eye on here for some of these teams, especially teams like Boston who have really just salted everything away, have nothing else to play for. These rotations are going to get wonky. Guys are going to get pulled out of games where it looks like things are, are salted away. The Lakers the other day, guys, they were up by 13 or 14 with a minute and a half left pulled everybody. They had to put LeBron James and Anthony Davis back on the floor for a final possession to Man. kill a comeback against the Washington Wizards. So these end of game scenarios, if you're laying some of these big numbers, just be aware of those spots because that can happen at the end of these games because these teams are trying to fit in rest as often as possible before the postseason starts. <clears throat> JVT, you're an everyday baseball better, and I respect your opinion. You and humans did great work uh, on previous shows on it. Today, our young friend Ben Wilson is all in on Tanner I Houck. Think. And the Red Sox to fade this fraud <laughs> that is the Angels. What? I mean, you, they're, they're hot. What are we talking about here? We got a young core of a lineup with the Angels. I'll tell you this. I actually do have something here. I bet Silseth over his Ks uh, in this one. So I think when you look at Silseth and some of the things that he does really well, guys, he actually generates swings and misses at a really high rate. Went over four and a half uh, in the start against Miami, despite giving up a few runs. He might give up some runs, but he's still going to mow guys down. So I did actually have action here. I bet him over his strikeouts, nice. but uh, I, I believe, I believe in the Angels. How dare you? Come ABT on. believer. My, you know, I'm not, I would say all in on Boston, but I well, am I am fading the Angels today. Just for today, JBT. And maybe extended after that. <laughs> Based on what's Speaking happening. Speaking of so frauds, far. the Milwaukee Bucks later today. Huh? <laughs> I, well, I'm not, I, I have no pushback on that with what we've seen so far. Follow him at me, JVT. Always kind of give us some time. Great to see you, man. Best of luck with the place. See you guys. Thanks, Jonathan. We'll have our best bets to wrap up the show when we come back on the Lombardi line. This is the Lombardi Line with former NFL executive Michael Lombardi. Now here is your host, Stormy Bonatoni, on VSEN, the sports betting network. DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn five bucks into one hundred and fifty dollars instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. Download the app and use promo code VSIN when you sign up. DraftKings Sportsbook, the crown is 
yours as we wrap things up. Sunday edition of the Lombardi Line from downtown Las Vegas and our Circus Sportsbook studio. Big thanks to our producer, Steph Behind the Glass, Isaiah, Aramis, Gaia, JB, all uh, in the house today. And it's time for some best bets here, Mike. You're sweating a little uh, live soccer, right? Uh, Premier League? Man U, <clears throat> under Liverpool? three and a, Yeah, under three and a half in uh, okay. Liverpool. Man U tied 1-1 one, one just about the 60th minute. So... Uh, Almost back to uh, where I made the bet at originally, which is about the 32nd minute, but a little bit of equity lost right now in terms of position. I have two plays today, both on the ice. I will probably end up in some version of betting South Carolina against Iowa in the women's yeah. game. But um, <clears throat> the wild card race in the East is, uh, is truly incredible. Pittsburgh, who three weeks ago had a 4% chance to make the playoffs, now holds the second wild card spot after winning four in a row. And then there's a log jam of six teams who are still alive. So I'm going to bet on a pair of teams that trail Pittsburgh by one point that are hosting games today and are in the exact same position, have a game in hand um, on the Penguins. The Red Wings are hosting the Sabres. Sabres are actually still technically not eliminated. They're three points behind the Red Wings and Capitals, four points behind um, <clears throat> Pittsburgh. Now, all these teams have basically uh, five or six games left to play in the regular season, so it'll be a terrific last couple of weeks. Sabres at Red Wings. Lion confirmed in goal. Uh, number one goalie for Detroit. I'm going to lay a short price at home here with the Red Wings minus 130. And then the Capitals, who have sort of stubbed their toe the last few Capitals were the same three weeks ago were about a 62% chance to make the playoffs, now find themselves on the outside looking, and they are hosting the Senators, who got beat at home last night in Ottawa by New Jersey. So a back-to-back -back for them. If Corpusalo goes, it's back-to-back. -back. Charlie Lindgren in that minus a dollar thirty-five for the Capitals. So two teams yeah. in very similar positions today as short home favorites. You're, you're also fading to a Senators team that's just been limping to the finish line. I mean, they got blasted 6 nothing at home by Florida in their yeah. previous home game. Had the one goal loss yesterday to the Devils. Pittsburgh was a seller at the deadline. They were. Like, Jay Gensel was the yep. big prize possession for uh, for you know the uh, for a lot of teams with where he would be moving on for Pittsburgh. And then you have the Detroit regression. Uh, what's happened to Philadelphia? I mean, seven Oof. straight losses. Well, um, that Tortorella message can, can wear thin um, pretty early. And some of his post-game comments every day about it's a team yeah. of guys that don't compete. And, and they've struggled. They got um, beat again last night in Columbus. I think they're out when they look to be pretty solidly in. Actually, we're the third team in that division for a long time. Uh, so um, it's wide open to see who's going to get it. Obviously, Tampa's pretty much locked up that top, top wild card unless Toronto fades enough that Tampa can uh, can actually get in above them in, in the race. So it, it, it will be interesting. In the West, it's pretty much done. Seems, I mean, the it seems, Blues no, are the done. only team that yeah, really it's, has it's a chance, over. but they're seven points back of both it's uh, over. Vegas a, and Nashville. A big game today away for the Central Division, uh, Dallas, who lost and lost their winning streak at Chicago yesterday, now goes uh, to Colorado. So a huge matchup Ooh. this afternoon. All eyes on that game in the NHL. Stars a three-point lead on the Avalanche. Yep. Five games yeah. to go. Avs are short uh, home favorites in yeah. that. And, yeah, I mean, it's been a red-hot uh, Dallas team. And you look at the uh, the futures right now, Stars uh, are still minus 550 to win that division. But, I mean... If they won today and they're a short dog, I mean, if they won be, in regulation today, they'd you they'd know be basically they'd, over. They'd, yeah. be, they'd be a you know an eight dollar favorite to win. Are you seeing the, any the similar uh, late game uh, chica anything in the NHL chicanery? Final few games similar uh -huh. to NBA stuff? No, but you will see teams that are desperate now on the outside pulling the goalie very early. Um, I think we saw twelve minutes ago the goalie was pulled the other night just because. They, you know, they've got to get the two points. I talked about it in no hyperbole, what, what John Hines is doing in Minnesota, pulling the goalie in overtime, which I think, yeah. and everybody said, oh, if you don't understand hockey, if you don't get behind this move, well, why wouldn't you pull them in regulation where if you won the, the, your opponent that you're chasing wouldn't get any points? Here That's you, a great point. Well, right? Here, they've already, you've already given up a point and you lose your point if it goes in. It, so I... And it, yeah, the narrative was, oh, this guy's like the hero because he set risk sacrificing a point to go for the uh, the empty net in overtime. And they were three which, and two in shootouts. I mean, the best you can do is two to one anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I, and also, too, what, I, 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 mean, get, I what, don't understand hockey, but I do understand the math. Well, and what, is, and what does the math say on, you know, what's the what's the four on three, you know, yeah, advantage, really advantage compared to, say, you know, six on five. 
uh, which obviously more traditional when you pull the goal. Well, the four on three also opens it up for the empty net goal the other way as well, as we saw with the Knights. Blo blocked shot, one pass and out, and, and Marshall Show scores, and it's over with a minute to go in overtime. Yeah. It worked once. It didn't work. Net negative result. Net negative result mm -hmm. for, uh, for for those Minnesota wide. Yeah. yeah. Well, you got two points out of it, but, I mean, you, w you were guaranteed two points, and you had a shot to win either shootout, right? Math, you would think it would be it's the math. Sometimes doesn't work out that way. Did you did you happen to see what the in-game price was on the Arizona Coyotes Friday night against uh, Vegas? Your one of your biggest uh, in-game comebacks of the season. I did not watch that game. We were supposed to have a watch party for it, but we know it was cold and very windy, and we ended up canceling it because it was at Stadium Swim. I know, like on Wednesday, somebody said, "Well, we can just move them inside of the book." I said, "How can you move them inside of the book? You can't have a watch party for the Knights in the middle of the Iowa UConn game and guarantee them sound." So we ended up canceling it, and I, I just saw the final. I didn't even watch it, any part of the game. Obviously, I was entrenched in the, in the, entrenched. In the women's game. It was truly Very emotionally draining it was, game. Uh, yeah, emotionally draining game. It, it was. was something, uh, something spectacularly horrific to, to watch, yeah. The block moving screen at the end of the game, were you up in arms about it? Some were very, I mean, very upset about this call. I wasn't. I mean, Seth Davis showed she was moving. She took a step I in mean, the elbow. Letter of the law. It's, I uh, I'd like I, to see if Becker's I, what she did. Shoot at three, try to drive with three seconds. Yeah. Well, again, I, I think it's more that we as fans, we want to see drama. We want to see stars yeah. with a chance to win the game at the end. But Here's the, the important thing is in no way did it affect the outcome from a side or total perspective, not right? It did, it did not. Right. <laughs> I thought the... Money the, line, I guess. Yes. Yeah, exactly. May, possibly. Well, the, and I mean, the, the previous sequence in that play, the, the baseline drive layup was there. <laughs> And yet the yeah. whole play was assuming that the defense would collapse on the inside, yet mm -hmm. the Iowa defense didn't. And then it just kind of everything got thrown off from there. The UConn easily could have had a wide open layup with their non-star. <laughs> Instead, they didn't take it. Anyway, as far as the women's college basketball for today, I did play one prop. I had the Camilo Cardo. So over nine and a half rebounds, a minus 130. I like that, especially compared to the fact DraftKings is offering her double-double prop at minus 160 today. Cardoso, even as a bench player last year, 14 points, 14 boards in that Final Four loss to Iowa, averages nearly a double-double on the season for Cardoso and uh, was just off a 22-point, 11-rebound game against NC State. There is not a single player on Iowa who can match her physicality on the interior, and I expect Cardoso to have her way uh, there in the paint, regardless of what happens uh, in this matchup. We had a listener tweet at us, where Bob, at Square Bob, uh, 2022 about his favorite is Hannah Stolke under under 14 points and he makes some good points about about the size she's given up to Cardosa. I she was a different player last year in that game but if you go back and watch that she you wouldn't have even really noticed her in that game against South Carolina in the semifinal in the game in which in which they won so her her prop at 14 points he likes under thanks to Bob for, for chiming 13 in 13 and a half, 13 and and a half at DraftKings yep. Uh, on that under so that's my my one play on the women's game for today as far as the baseball i am backing tanner hauk at the red sox minus, all in my <laughs> minus 109 10 90 <laughs> uh, today how 580 uh, era at fenway last year which it's understandable second uh, toughest park to pitch in for pitchers to only coors field on the road a sub 420 era a season ago he was terrible against lefties last year angels don't really have any lefties in their lineup and they're bad when they do hit a 139 uh, sorry 103 four for 39 is the, the hitting result so far for Angel lefties this season. I agree with our last guest, Jonathan Montobo. Chase Silseth does get a lot of swing and misses. He also gives up a lot of homers, over 20% home run to fly ball rate a season ago. Walks a lot of guys. I see a lot of homers, walks, and strikeouts today for Silseth. I like the way this Red Sox offense is playing early in the season. A bounce-back performance for them today after only giving uh, getting one run across yesterday uh, in a 2-1 loss there to the Angels. Rubber match of a three-game series. I'll take that a short price with a short road favorite, Boston Red Sox. I did bet a prop the other day, and the market may have changed a little bit, but when Yuri Perez was ruled out, I bet Marlins for worst record in baseball. Still available at 18-1 to on Thursday. I don't know if it's moved at all since then. 0-9. Oh they are awful. And they've lost every run line. It's almost like when did you, you win that? every game by a run, it, that tends to even out the following season. Like the Minnesota to. Vikings, right? In in the NFL, won all the when all the close decisions. Fewest one year. wins at DraftKings. The Marlins uh, are twenty-two to one. Oh, even better number. It's even better. They literally yeah. have not won a game. I mean, look, the, it's not like the A's are much better. 
and lost every plus run line, as Greg Hoops Peterson points out. The only game they lost by one, they were the favorite, minus the run and a half. Hard to do. <laughs> Hard to do. Miami Marlins, will they get off the schneid today? Uh, time will tell. Big thanks to everybody behind the glass here at Circa. Our producer, Stephanie, as we say so long for Mike Palm, I'm Ben Wilson. It's The Handle with our guy Matt Brown and Mike Samich coming your way next here on VEASAN, the Sports Betting Network. 